This is a Fox News alert. Right now, federal appeals court judges are deciding whether to restore President Trump's executive order blocking arrivals from seven majority Muslim countries. The ruling could come at any moment, and of course, we'll bring you there live if it does. But first, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Just a short time ago, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals heard arguments from the Trump administration and the opposing states. Those would be Washington and Minnesota. We'll talk to a Republican critic of the travel ban in just a second. But first, here's what just happened in court a minute ago. Has the government pointed to any evidence connecting these countries with terrorism? These proceedings have been moving very fast. I can, uh, and uh, the, the, the strongest point on that is that uh, in 2015 and 2016, both Congress and the administration made determinations that it, these seven countries posed the greatest risk of terrorism, that, and in doing so, uh, restricted visa waiver to people who had even, even, uh, even traveled to those countries over the last five or six years. Uh, the, the executive order relies on that determination. Your Honor, the case law from this court and the Supreme Court is very clear that to prove religious discrimination, we do not need to prove that this order harms only Muslims or that it harms every Muslim. We just need to prove that it was motivated in part by a desire to harm Muslims. And we but have how alleged you, that. How do you infer that desire if, in fact, the vast majority of Muslims are unaffected? Well, Your Honor, in part, you can infer it from intent evidence. I mean, there are statements that we've quoted in our complaint uh, that are rather shocking evidence of intent to discriminate against Muslims, given that we haven't even had any discovery yet. Uh, to, to, to find out what else might have been said in private. I mean, the, the public statements from the president and his top advisors reflecting that intent are, are strong evidence, and certainly at this pleading stage, uh, to allow us to go forward on that claim. Well, New York Congressman John Faso is a Republican, newly elected, but he's also a critic of the president's order, saying it was neither well-drafted nor well-implemented. Congressman joins us here in the studio. Congressman, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. So it's kind of hard to argue with well-drafted, well-implemented. Okay. Uh, you said this in a press release. Um, this is most, this being any kind of restrictions on immigration from these countries, most effectively pursued through thoughtful and deliberate legislation. God bless you for suggesting a legislative answer, I think. Yeah. What would that legislation look like? What would the thoughtful legislation achieving this goal be? Well, I think the, let's see what happens with the Court of Appeals. Right. But I do think thoughtful legislation was done previously by Congress where they identified those seven countries and they were worried about the fact that those countries did not have proper internal procedures to vet those people right. who were looking to come to the United States. Where I think the order went awry was when they were looking at people who had dual citizenship, people who had already had visas, who had already gone through a process. So I'm hopeful now that uh, they will have a more deliberative process internally, and I think they're doing that, to fix uh, the mistakes that were in the executive order. Now, if the court upholds the lower court decision, then this is going to last for uh, a few weeks more, certainly maybe months more, while the Supreme Court ultimately considers this. But if the court rules as I think they will, which is that the plaintiffs don't have, the two states, don't actually have standing to bring this case, then I think it's incumbent upon the administration to fix the implementation. And I think, uh, I think they're on the way to doing but that. But why wouldn't it be incumbent upon the legislative branch to pass laws that have the same effect, which is to protect the country. Well, uh, we, we can very much do that. And I think first thing, Congress should have some hearings, do an inquiry in, into this. But clearly the, the pattern over the last 50 years has been to give the president, the executive under the law, right. wide powers to protect the national interests of the United States. And I would note, and some of the critics ignore this, President Obama uh, made multiple uh, decisions of this nature, not of the broad reaching nature as, as President Trump did, but he specifically, as late as January, restricted the rights of Cubans right. to come into the we United States. He just did that, that's he right. He just did it in January. And if I went back uh, tonight looking at some of the other executive orders that President Obama and President Bush made, and in the last 10 years, we've seen probably two dozen similar efforts by a president to restrict the travel into the United States from uh, foreign nationals of countries where we were either having economic sanctions or we were having other disputes, whether it be uh, the Ukraine, parts of the Ukraine, Russia, uh, 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 countries in Africa. So, I mean, certain, uh, look, the criticism is 
diffuse. Some of it is about the way this was implemented, right. such as yours. Some of it is philosophical, and you get the sense that a lot of the critics of this don't believe the U.S. government has the moral right to make distinctions between countries of origin. So let me just ask you a couple of philosophical questions to get your sense of this. Do you think we face, in the aggregate, generally, a greater threat from immigrants who come from Somalia than we do from immigrants who come from, say, South Korea? Is without, that a fair without a doubt, absolutely. Without a doubt. They do, because if you look at the, at the governance or lack thereof in a place like Somalia, where there's mayhem and chaos uh, widely uh, right. available in the country, as opposed to South Korea, in your example, where there's a rule of law, there's order, there's a process whereby the citizens can be vetted, and where those countries, South Korea or others that are, we have close relationships with, can have a good uh, relationship between our consular officials, our embassies, etc. And so when they say, here's our, our, our countryman wanting to come to the United States, he's looking for a visa, right. we have a process whereby we can have confidence that when they say this person is okay, and we vet them ourselves, we have confidence in that the person is who they say they of, are. Of course, and it's com it comports with common sense. So your second question. Our current understanding is that foreigners have a right to come here until we can show they, they pose a, a danger to us in some way. Shouldn't our assumption be that nobody has a right to come here until they can show us the benefit of their coming here? Well, I think that uh, what we would want, we want to be careful about the, we, making, being overbroad here, Tucker, because we do have countries where we have close economic and political right. relationships. Germany, France, the United Kingdom, etc., Ireland. Um, Denmark, uh, Japan, South Korea. So uh, we don't want to make it unduly difficult for universities, for tech companies, for bi business travelers. But you're proving, to come my, in you're proving my point. You're saying that those immigrants benefit the United States in some material, measurable way. That's right. Shouldn't that be the standard for all immigrants? Uh, love to have you. Tell us what you can do for us. Why wouldn't that be rationally acting in our own interest? Well, and one thing that we, we could be doing that, and we should be doing that rationally in our own interest. And one of the things that we should be doing is we should look at what are the benefits that a potential immigrant could bring to this country, rather than, say, a, a preference for, say, family reunification, which you have in the law now. So we could make that change and, and focus on people who could bring either uh, commercial skills, business skills, cultural skills into the country. You want to do that. You want to encourage that. But see, I don't understand why Congress doesn't do that. So if you look at the polling on immigration issues, refugees particularly, but also low-skilled immigration, which obviously depresses wages. Right. That's why employers of low-skilled employees are a favor of it. Um, People are not for this. This summer there was a poll done in Chicago. 36% of Americans supported resettling Syrian refugees here. Why wouldn't the Congress take that up? They're supposed to be representing the people. Why wouldn't mm -hmm. they say, no Syrian refugees? People aren't for it. Well, I think what we should do vis-a-vis -vis the humanitarian crisis in Syria, we should look at establishing safe zones in that region and help them, help Jordan, help other countries who would be willing to temporarily relocate uh, people from Syria before they, uh, so when the conflict ends, they are able to hopefully go back to their homeland. Uh, that's something that we should do. We always have had, though, a, an impulse in this country to, for humanitarian reasons, to bring in people who have been oppressed or victims of war or other things. But the overriding issue in terms of uh, our benefit to the United States is, I think, an important one. And look at, look at the district I represent in upstate New York. We need to bring in workers, migrant workers, in and out of the country. It's gotten increasingly difficult to bring in workers to harvest the crops, to pick the fruit, et cetera. So those people come in and they go out, and we need to have a, a good uh, expeditious system whereby fruit growers and farmers can allow that to happen. Do you think certain industries have a moral right to low-wage labor? Because, of course, without the flow of that labor across borders, they would have to pay market rate. You, you right? know, Tucker, the apple growers in the Hudson Valley, you know what they've told me? What? They can't get Americans to pick At the what fruit. price? At, at virtually any price. Any price, yes. really? Yeah, it's really amazing. And it's tough work. And they'd much rather have uh, migrants coming in from the Caribbean who come in during the harvest season and then go home. Are you worried that, broadly speaking, not just in the apple orchards of New York, but that the United States is creating a kind of surf class where low-wage immigrants come and do the unpleasant work that Americans don't want to do? And is that healthy for the democracy long term? Well, I, I'm not really worried about that. I'm more worried about getting more economic growth in our country so that we can lift the opportunity for everyone. And I, that's why we need to do the tax and regulatory changes that I ran on and I think that President Trump ran on and that the Republican Congress is, is hopefully going to be able to effectuate. I think that's the bigger problem for us right now. We have a slow growth economy. 
and that's really hurting our ability to increase family income. But if you have a country where anybody who makes over 200 grand a year, which is everyone in the political establishment, everyone in the media, everyone in Hollywood, the people yeah. running the show have no contact with things like washing the car, changing your own kids' diapers, doing your own laundry, doesn't it create... And I'm not attacking this. I mean, I'm one of those people. But doesn't it create a pretty big disconnect between the ruling class and the rest of the country? I think the the vast majority of the country, when they have a kid, they know how to change diapers. But I'm saying, I know but you know I exactly did. what I'm talking about. Yeah. I mean, they're in, you've walked through neighborhoods here. There's not one person who would know how to yeah. wash his car, or change his yeah. car, right? I mean. Does that have an effect on the culture that we should be worrying about? Well, I think maybe it does. Uh, that's a profound question. I'm not so sure in this particular instance. Uh, I'm, I'm not focused on that. I'm focused on trying to make sure we get this immigration ruling right. right and that we uh, make sure that our friends and allies abroad understand that we're a welcoming country, but also making sure that we are, and the president is right in this regard, making sure we're protecting ourselves from migrants who are coming into the country or potential uh, bad actors coming into the country who are coming from places where there's no security, where they we're not vetting those people properly. I think that's the primary issue that I'm concerned about right My now. My last question, just to get a philosophical one. I often hear people say that, and I understand we want the rest of the world to know we're a welcoming country. Right. But why exactly? I mean, Japan is not a welcoming country. China is not a welcoming country. It's not that they're diminished in the eyes of the rest of the world, are they? Our national motto, out of many, one, e pluribus unum. I mean, we are, we are a melting pot. We have always been that way. And I think we, we should maintain that. What we should be do it smartly. And we've had periods in our history where we've restricted immigration and we're, where we've enhanced it. And maybe we're in a period where we're looking at bringing in more people who have greater job skills, greater potential to contribute to our economy than in the past. And I think that would be advisable. But at the same time, let's not forget how this country was founded and what we stand on. All right. Congressman, thanks all for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate it.